Matthew chapter number 12. Verse number 9. The Bible says, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day? Will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the others. Then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him how they might destroy him. Now, we picked up halfway through a confrontation between the Pharisees and Jesus. They lost, by the way. But there's a great uh, theological and legal debate happening here, starting in verse number 1 all the way down. First, Jesus and his disciples went through the corn, and they were hungry, so they picked some corn to eat. And the Pharisees wanted to stone the disciples because they had worked on the Sabbath day. And now keep in mind, that law, that man should not labor on the Sabbath day, that wasn't man's law, that was God's law. Right? Man didn't come up with that, God came up with that. But, I mean, I go back and look, he even told them, when they were in the wilderness with Moses, he said on the day before the Sabbath, go out, get twice as much manna and quail as you need, because you're not supposed to labor on the Sabbath day. Right? Well, we go back before chapter number 12. Right? Go all the way and actually study out what Jesus and his disciples were doing. They were not, uh, you know, staying in one spot, reaping and sowing. Right? They didn't bring their fisher boats with them when they followed after Jesus. What did he say? He said, come after me, I'll make you fishers of men. That's what he told them. Their occupation was that they were a disciple of Jesus. Jesus didn't stay in one spot for a long time. Three and a half years in his earthly ministry, he covered a lot of ground. A lot of travel. They weren't throwing seed in the ground, toiling it, and then waiting for the food to come up so that they could have something to eat. In fact, they needed money to pay their taxes. What did Jesus do? He went over, grabbed a fish, opened the fish up, and there was money in it. Enough to pay their taxes. Right? They were reliant upon the grace of God. So if they didn't labor that day, and really they didn't labor, right? if we, we want to get real technical, right? and the debater and Jordan comes out, they didn't labor that day. They just walked by and they reaped. Right? They weren't sowing. They weren't digging in the ground. It literally said they just picked it off of the stalk and just kept on walking. Right? Well, I find that even in the wilderness, that manna, don't study it out, says that it was before they turned it into food, it was as coriander. It was a seed color of coriander. Right, it had to be ground up, had to be made into cakes. Right, or ground up and turned into flour so that you could use it to make it into something else. Well, when were you doing that? On the day that you harvested it. But if you turned it into the flour too soon, it'd go bad. You telling me that there wasn't somebody somewhere back in the wilderness would wake up and stoke the fire of the oven so that they could make the more cakes that they had prayed the day before on the day of the Sabbath. But what if they did live in a desert place? People associate that with being hot all the time until the sun goes down. It got very cold at the night because there was no tree, there was no vegetation, there was nothing that would keep the heat of the sun trapped in, so to speak. And in fact, that's why as the night goes on longer, it gets colder until the sun comes back up again. Right? But we've got enough Kentucky around here that it traps a good amount of the heat a lot of the time. I mean, one night I let Champ out. 
I don't know, about 1230 at night, I opened the door, but I got knocked out by the humidity. It was like 90 degrees outside and 80% humidity at midnight. I'm thinking, how in the world did that happen? Right? It wasn't that hot when I went to bed. What happened? Well, the opposite in the desert. As soon as the sun goes down, it starts cooling off quick. The wind starts gusting. It gets very cold. Do you think these Pharisees would have considered making a fire in their hearts labor? They needed it to survive. You tell me they didn't have a fireplace on the Sabbath? Are you telling me that the things that they needed to do to live were considered labor? No, those things weren't considered labor. Really, if you were talking, all they did was reach out, grab, take. You got to do more effort than that to get dressed and come to the house of God. Are you considering that they, I mean, you really thinking that they considered getting dressed in the morning a labor before they went to the synagogue that day? I don't think so. What are they doing? Uh, verse number 14 tells us they went out and held counsel against them how they might destroy them. They were looking for an excuse. They were, they were swallowing camels and straining at gnats that day. They were trying to find every loophole that they could to get Jesus. And guess what? They didn't. Because the words that he spoke were truth. Right? In fact, they were more than truth. They were life. It was what they needed, but yet they refused to hear it. But I want to get into what Jesus actually said. Okay? They had already had an altercation about that. And by altercation, I mean verbal. Jesus didn't smite them, although he could have done this and wiped them off the face of the earth. He didn't. And he winked at their ignorance in hopes that those around them and that they themselves would hear the truth. So, verse number 9 rolls around, they went and departed thence. Where? Into the house of God. On the Sabbath day, where could you find Jesus? In the house of God. Didn't matter where he went. Didn't matter what town he was in. Sabbath day came around, where was he? In his father's house doing his father's business. If you wanted to find Jesus on the Sabbath day and you knew he was around, good bet you're going to find him down in the synagogue. And he wasn't there rebuking and reviling. Most of the time you find him sitting down doing what? Teaching. Right? Giving the very word of God unto the people that God loved. So, verse number 10, there was a man, where? At the synagogue which had his hand with her. And they, being the Pharisees, asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse him. Because again, he had just gotten away with the whole, they weren't laboring. Right? They were doing what they needed to survive. Is that considered labor? Then they said, No. So then they come in here and they said, What about healing? That takes a little bit more effort than just reaching a hand out, grabbing some corn. So what about healing? Now, they feigned interest because none of these suckers could heal. Right? They weren't touched of God. They weren't prophets. Right? All they know is that the prophet, prophets in the Old Testament, right back here, most of the time if God used them to heal somebody, God would have them go about a certain way so that it would be a sign to those that saw it. Because the Bible tells you that the Greeks seek after wisdom, but the Hebrews seek after what? A sign. So, I mean, anytime you go look at Elijah or Elisha, anytime that they raised someone, well, it was always a sign. It wasn't just be healed. Right? He would stretch himself out over the body of the deceased young man. Right? Pray. What was that for? It was a sign to those others that God obeyed or God honored the obedience of one of his servants. Right? Why did Elijah have all that water dumped on the altar there with the prophets of Baal trying to pray down fire out of heaven. Well, it was a sign that this isn't something I did. It had to be God in order to light this fire. That whole thing soaking wet. Right? It was to remove doubt because the Jews required a sign. Okay, well, they said, well, what about healing? That's got to take some effort. Here's what they didn't understand. As easy as it was for Jesus to say, let's go to the synagogue, Jesus could say, be healed, and it was going to happen. Now, they didn't have John chapter number 1 yet. 
But in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. Right? By Him and through Him do all things consist. Without Him was nothing made. What's that tell me? Back in the beginning when God said, let there be light, Jesus was the one that said it. Why? Because He's the Word. The Father and the Holy Ghost of the Son said, all right, whenever it happened, they said, let's start creating. And Jesus said, all right, step one. We've talked about this already. Let there be light. There was light. He didn't have to do anything, which is what he's about ready to show them. Jesus didn't touch him, didn't lay hands on him. Jesus didn't have him sit down and, you know, prop up his leg and prepare, you know, some ointment or anything like that. That's what they were expecting, to heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus just said it. Why? Because he's Almighty God. If he wills it to happen, if he says it, that it's going to happen. He doesn't have to do anything. He didn't have to say it. He could have thought it, and it would have been done. Right? Well, verse number 11, he says, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and have fallen in a pit on the Sabbath, and will not lay hold on it and lift it out? Jesus is saying, you can do your best to avoid laboring on the Sabbath. He says, you can put up the pen with the sheep. You can have shepherds out in the field with the sheep. But what if one of them sheep falls in a pit? He says, you're going to leave it there until the next day? Well, if it's injured, it's going to die. Depending on how long it's been since it ate, Maybe a reason it fell into a pit is because it was hungry. It was looking for some food. Fell into a pit. It may starve by the time you get to it tomorrow. What if there's an animal that's capable of getting in the pit but also getting out of the pit that wants to eat that sheep? It's not going to make it another day. He says, you all know that. He says, you also value that sheep. Because in all reality, God gave them that sheep. God gave him that sheep for a reason. God doesn't do anything without a purpose. Yet if they were entrusted with the sheep by God, it's their responsibility to go get the sheep. That's not labor. We'll find out what it is here in a second. That's not work. That's not toiling. That's something you have to do. Right? God, God forbid something happened to one of our family members today that require me to go to the hospital during church service that's not something I want to do I want to be here right? that's not necessarily late. I didn't plan it out to go do that so that I get benefit out of it no, but if I'm required to do it I must do it because if I don't do it nobody else is going to do it that's the point he's getting if the disciples didn't feed themselves earlier that day nobody would have Right? And truly, they're just walking through a field of corn. What were they really living off of? The grace and the goodness of God. Right? That God had the corn there for them to eat as they was walking through. Then we don't have time to get into the Old Testament law of gleaning. Of those that did not have could go and find a place where they could get some. Right? That was an old Jewish law. They don't have time to get into that. But they weren't stealing. That's the point I'm trying to get to. That food was there for those of the people that needed it. Jesus said, well, God was good enough to these people that they had extra corn so that when the disciples got hungry, they could eat it. Yeah, well, keep going. Verse number 12, how much better, or how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? That's what Jesus is getting. That's the heart of the matter. Is it lawful or is it illegal to do well? Not to do good. You can do a lot of good things that God doesn't get glory from. There are good things according to man's intellect, according to man's morals, that God doesn't have anything to do with in the house of God. That you can get up and try and convince somebody that they're lost, but unless the Holy Ghost is in it, it's all in vain. In fact, you're probably doing more harm than you are doing good. That's why we're 
led by the Holy Spirit. Unless God opens the door, we can't walk through it. And if God shuts the door, nothing you can do is going to open it. You can be trying to do good, but are you doing well? He says, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath? Then he says, then he says to the man, stretch forth thine hand. Didn't lay hands on him. Didn't pray for him. Although, by the way, Jesus is at the right hand of God praying for you. He's our intercessor. Seated at the right hand of the Father. He didn't pray for this fellow saying, Father, heal him. He didn't tell one of the disciples to go over and lay hands on him. He didn't anoint him with oil. What did he say? Stretch forth thine hand. He didn't even say, be healed. He just said, hey, do this. Now what the Pharisees don't see in this situation, which later we find out about, right? Jesus could have said, stretch forth thine hand, but if that man be didn't believe that Jesus could heal him, he wouldn't have stretched forth his hand. When James and Peter, I mean, when John and Peter walked into the temple on Acts chapter number 4, they saw that man begging. Peter turned to him and said, silver and gold, I don't have that. But what I do have, I'll give to you. What was it? Jesus. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. But if that man didn't believe in Jesus, and that Jesus had the power to heal him, he wouldn't have got up. He'd have stayed on his bed. But it said, he had himself a little bit of the, you know, happy fits around the temple, which made the Pharisees angry. Because they didn't think it was reverenced enough. What? Go over there and see where David danced before the Lord. See what God did to the one that judged David for worshiping God. She never had children. Why? Because she looked down on one that worshiped God. He said, well, that's not the way that I would have done it. Well, that's why God saved them. Because he wanted this worship and that worship. And he's worthy of all of it. But see... Jesus has said, stretch forth your hand. That man didn't believe that Jesus could heal him. That man sided with the Pharisees and said, well, I wasn't seeking to be healed on the Sabbath day. I was here to worship God today. Well, what greater worship is there than faith that God would do what he said he would do? Truly worship is reverencing God, giving him honor and glory. What more glory is there than denying the doubts of self, the fear of self, right? the failures of self, and just reaching out and believing that God would do something. Did not John say, he must increase, I must decrease? You know what faith really does? It makes you let go of yourself and grab onto God. Less of you and more of him. God got a whole lot of glory out of this whole situation. And Jesus did it in a way that made the Pharisees even angrier. They said, man, he didn't fall for the bait. He didn't reach out and he didn't lay hands on them. That would have been work. He would have had to actually move. He said all he did was talk. He gave a commandment, but that's not against the law. He said he didn't give a commandment that was against the things of God because he's in the synagogue that could have got him for that. They was looking at every angle they could. But how did Jesus do it? In decent and in order. Not just as those that come to God must worship and in spirit and in truth. In decent and in order. Right, but the point that Jesus was trying to make through all this, then the Pharisees go out and they get angry and they sought occasion to destroy him. They couldn't find it. But the whole point down in verse number 12 wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days see these people had in their mind that all they were supposed to do on the Sabbath was go to the house of God and as Pharisees they were supposed to tell everybody else how unspiritual and unrighteous they were by making themselves out to be very spiritual very righteous, very holy they were supposed to go out and they were supposed to collect tithes they were supposed to offer up sacrifices unto God 
all for the purpose of ostensibly giving God glory but really it was about these fellows because on the Sabbath day they were center stage besides the priests the Pharisees were the ones there that had the first five books of the Old Testament committed to memory who do you think was doing the teaching in the synagogues right if someone were to come to the Sabbath at the synagogue and they had an ought with a brother they had to get that resolved outside before they could enter in or else they weren't right with God who do you think was the judge in those situations the Pharisees the scribes right? the Sadducees those that had titles but yet they had very little in a relationship with God they were living by the letter of the law well if you live by the law you'll die by the law because if a man's guilty in one part of the law he's guilty of the whole law the Bible tells us funny how people who try to hold things over people's heads forget those things that are held over their own it's funny how those that thought they knew what the house of God was about how little they actually did know Jesus at 12 walked in and dumbfounded the scholars in Jerusalem the chief of the chief you didn't get to worship in the city of God lead a Sunday school class in the Jerusalem the very house of God the city of God city of David the place that one of these days he's going to come back and he's going to set up his throne right? you didn't get to that place unless you were revered respected right? you knew what you was talking about and yet Jesus walked in at 12 and blew their minds. Imagine really if he just peeled back the lid of the can of knowledge that he could have poured out. It, they would have exploded. Wouldn't have been able to contain it. But yet he asked them one, one, all the questions they're asking Jesus. This is a question he comes back. Is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath? To do well. What he's saying is, if it's right to do on Monday, or in this case on Sunday, was it right to do on Saturday? If God would approve it over here, why wouldn't God approve it here? Right? If it's something that has to be done, if it's something that God gets the glory for, and it may inconvenience us, but does it inconvenience God is what he's trying to ask. Why was the Sabbath given? As a reminder, one, a day of rest. But two, a reminder to them that everything that they had was made in six days by a thrice holy God. And that that was the day that they were to reverence Him. He rested on the Sabbath, so they rested on the Sabbath, but they also worshipped on the Sabbath. What was the point of the Sabbath? To honor God. Well, you can do good things that have no eternal impact maybe some of that wood hay and stubble right? now don't get me wrong every now and then somebody needs wood to keep the fire at their house warm right? every now and then you need some stubble to feed some animals right? some hay go out and plant new grass right? God can use them things but he doesn't use them just to get more wood hay and stubble What's he, do? he uses those things to confound the wise so that there is gold, silver, and precious gems. We should be heaping to ourselves those things and care not for the wood, hay, and the stubble. Yeah, it's all around us. Yeah, we got to live in it, got to work with it, got to put up with it, but these are the things that we treasure. Those precious things that in the eyes of God are worth actually laboring for. They say, not this stuff, that the mundane those things that are well but what do what does doing well do well it glorifies God doing well denies the impulses of the flesh doing well exalts the name of Jesus which according to God is a name above every other name right? telling the good news of the fact that Jesus did come that's well now, if we were to go over, 
We don't have time because it took too long in the introduction. But if we were to go over and look at what the Apostle Paul wrote, if we were to go over and look at the anticipation of meeting our Lord, does Jesus say, you done good? Or does he say, well done? Well done. Now we are supposed to do good to others, but there's a way you can do good for your own benefit. The Bible talks about them, they're gainsayers, they're hirelings, men pleasers. They speak with enticing words of man's wisdom, but yet they're sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Why? Because they don't have charity. They don't have compassion. They don't show mercy. What do they have? They have more dominion. Where Jesus came to set people free, other people want to keep them in bondage. Using the name of Jesus to do it. What's the Bible say? They're twofold the child of hell. You can try and do good for somebody, but for your own reasons. Or you can do good to somebody because it's what God desired. Not that you receive on your own. What did Jesus get out of healing this fellow? He didn't gain anything. In fact, all that happened, Jesus bore that man's sin on the cross of Calvary. And what did he get out of the situation? Well, did this fellow get saved? I believe he did, because if he had enough faith to be healed, he had enough faith to be saved. But really, what did God merit out of that situation? He got very little. Some clay. Right? Sin cursed man. But yet he said, I can take that and I can do well with it. But what is doing well? That's not where I'm the one in the driver's seat. Right? I'm not even in the co pilot seat. Right? I'm all the way in the back of the plane enjoying the ride. It's where God calls the shots and he's the one that gets the credit. And I just happen to be the vessel that he used to do it. These Pharisees had an issue with discerning the one that was doing the work and the vessel that was used to pour out the work. Okay? Who put the corn there? Well, man may have planted it. Who caused it to grow? God. Who had the corn ripe at that time of year so that as the disciples walked through that part of the field, he knew that the food they needed would be there? God. Okay, what was the vessel of receiving God's benefit? Their hand. They didn't do any of the work, they just reaped it. Okay, well, who did the healing in the synagogue that day? God. Who was the vessel? Well, in this case, God. Jesus. But truly, why did that man get healed? Jesus could have wanted to heal him all he wanted to, but if that man didn't believe, belief was the vessel. Well, who gave that to him? God. Because God gave unto every man a measure of faith. God did all the work. That man just had to receive it. He had to believe. Right, well... When we come to the house of God, surely if we have a good service, what's the cause of that? God, Holy Ghost walk through. Why? Because all of us decided instead of you know being stumbling blocks, we just want to be vessels of honor unto Him. We come and empty ourselves out of everything, including us, our praise, our worship, our you know concerns, the weights that do, do so easily beset us. We cast all our cares on Him so that we can get all of the world off of our minds so that we can come in and just be about Him. That takes a lot of effort, but is it work? No. It's not labor. If you do it, you do well. Because that's the way that God intended it to be. In fact, He not only encourages, He commanded us right, to lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us, that we should deny the flesh, deny the world, and embrace what? Godliness. Well, how do you do that? With a little bit of work. But it's not labor. 
God commands us to do it. Just like God commanded them to be dressed in the right apparel when they went into the synagogue. That wasn't labor, that was obedience. But if while you're at the house of God, God says, get up and go hug that person's neck, or get up and grab that person's hand, get them in the altar and pray for them. Well, Lord, I'm trying to listen to preaching right now. Well, in their minds, well, this is the Lord's day. We don't do, we don't do the labor on the Lord's day. That man would have walked out just as lame as he was when he walked in. That sheep would have died out in the pit. We say that we're here to honor God, but if God instructs us to do something that would bring honor unto Him, and we don't do it, we're hypocrites. Just like they were hypocrites. They would have done more than what the disciples did and thought that they were justified with God. But yet we come in and we think that we know what it is God wants us to do. No, God wants us to do well. Don't want us to stick to our little cheat sheet of things that we're allowed to do inside of the church house. What do you think the purpose of soul liberty is? That you don't have to live on every word that the pastor says. Right? The pastor doesn't give out a list of commandments every week that we all got to live by. You know why that is? Because it's not the pastor's job to keep you right with God. That's the Holy Ghost's job. Why do you think God gave you the Holy Ghost? One, Jesus said it's better that the Comforter come. Now, we've talked on that. Jesus could only have been in one place at one time in the flesh because he was constrained by the flesh that he chose to put on. Holy Ghost doesn't have that limitation. That, he's just as much in you if you're saved this morning as he is in me. Pastor didn't get any more or any less than anybody else because God's no respect our persons. You know what the Holy Ghost tells the pastor? Same thing that the Holy Ghost tells you. You need to get closer to God. You know what the Holy Ghost does for me that He does for you? He shows us where we're not right with God and places that we are right with God. You know what He does? He discerns the spiritual words of the Bible and speaks them to your soul so that you can understand them because the Word is spiritually discerned. Right? He's the friend that does stick us closer to the brother. Because he's a part of you. Do you think that all that the Holy Ghost does on a Lord's Day is considered labor in the eyes of God? No. Because he's doing the office work of the Holy Ghost. But two, he's doing it all not to bring glory to himself, but glory to the Son of God. What's that? It's doing well. So just because we think that, well, that's not something that I would normally do, good. It's usually when God gets you out of your comfort zone, that business starts picking up. It's usually when it makes you feel uncomfortable, that's the flesh fighting against what God wants to do. But see, I want to take it one step further. He's talking about the Sabbath day. We could spend here all day long talking about things that people think are holy and righteous on Sundays. When a supposed to be coming out and worshiping God but God doesn't get any glory from it then in the eyes of God it's nothing but foolishness but we don't have time to tackle all those things today that's not my job as I said that's the Holy Ghost's job you know how you ought to worship how God tells you to worship through the Holy Ghost you know how you ought to come in and reverence God whatever the Holy Ghost tells you you do it if he doesn't tell you you do it don't do it and if you don't know if he's talking or if he's not talking, get in the altar, get right with God, and then you'll know. Because he said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. If you want to know what you're supposed to do in a church service, as long as you're right with God, he'll tell you. But see, let's extend this to days that aren't worship days in the eyes of the world. Is it awful to do well on Monday? didn't ask is it lawful to labor it's under the law yeah they could go out and they could work in the field on Mondays but in all their labor did they do well in all that they did did they do it for the honor and glory of God or did they do it because they thought they needed to do it why did the Pharisees act the way that they did on the Sabbath because they thought that it made them right with God they were wrong 
but that's what they thought. When we go out Monday through Saturday, what we do, does it really do well, or are we just doing it? Do we do it because we think we have to, or do we do it because we know it's the will of God for us to do it? Do we go and work the job to get the paycheck, or do we go and work the job understanding that God's the one that gave us the job, gave it to us for a reason, not just to bless us with a paycheck, but there's a reason He wanted you at this spot at this moment in time. Do we take the reins and say, well, Lord, today we're going to do well? Yeah, I've got to go and I've got to work, but there's a reason God wants me to go and do it. Because if God didn't want you to do it, He'd give, either give you a different job, right? Or He'd change the circumstances at your job to where there was something that you couldn't do for Him. You don't believe me? Go read about the lives of Joseph sold him to slavery by his brothers everywhere that he went why did he go there because God had a purpose for him if God didn't have a purpose for him at Potiphar's house he wouldn't have gone down to Potiphar's house God didn't have a purpose for him down there at Pharaoh's house he wouldn't have ended up down to Pharaoh's house you say but he was in slavery yeah but he was where God wanted him to be at you say it's hard but you can do well in hardness But why do we go through the routine that we go through every day? Is it because we think that that's what we ought to do? Are we so accustomed to the routine that we just don't even think about choices anymore? It's already pre-planned out. Well, here's what my Mondays is going to look like. Here's what Tuesday is going to be. Well, it's Thursday. That means I've got to get over here by this amount of time in order to get this done. Where's doing well in any of that? I promise you there's enough time in the day for you to do what you need to get done because God promised to take care of all your needs. But then there's also enough time left over that you can do well along the way. There's times you find the Apostle Paul, he wasn't preaching, wasn't teaching, what was he doing? He was sitting down working with his hands. There are times that God just called somebody to give a gift that gave him enough money to get to the next town. There's other times that he had to work in order to eat. And the Apostle Paul wasn't above it. Find him mending nets. Find him mending tents. Right? He knew how to use his hands, but all the while he was laboring, God got the glory for it. He was doing well. He wasn't just punching a time card. Right? He wasn't just running errands. In fact, most of the time you find that as they were out walking around the city, what were they doing? Most of the time they were probably just running errands. They'd see something, either the Apostle Paul or him and whoever he was with. Like they'd see a table that said, To the unknown God, and then the Holy Ghost starts stirring up underneath them. He'd look over at Simon and he'd say, Hey, I'm, I'm fixing to you know, start preaching. And Simon said, But go ahead. No, whatever, we, but this can wait. You go, then what happened? Next thing you know, Paul's up there preaching against every single one of them other gods, telling them about the true God. But, but, Lord, I've got this to do. Yeah, but then people need to hear about Jesus. Truly, there's enough time that if it needs to get done, you can wake up a little bit earlier and do it tomorrow, if you had to. But most of us won't. Right, because we know what we're supposed to do on Tuesdays. Or we know what we're supposed to do on Fridays. We've got our Saturday planned out four weeks in advance. What about doing well? But if it's lawful to do well on the Sabbath, it's lawful to do well on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's lawful every day. And really what Jesus was asking when he said, is it lawful? What he's saying is, is it right with God? Does it please the Father to do well on the Sabbath? The answer was yes. You know what the law was? A list of things that God said are sin. Show me in the law where doing well was ever a sin. Now there have been a lot of people that tried to do good, but did it the wrong way, caused a whole bunch of sin. 
David, in his mind, tried to make his relationship with Bathsheba legitimate. What did he do? He killed her husband. Why? So that he can marry her and make it legit. That wasn't doing well. Far from it. In fact, it's what kept David from building the very temple of God. God said, you're a man of bloody hands. Took innocent blood. He said, but I'll let your son build it. That's good enough for David. You know how I know that? Because he did well. He got all the materials ready so that when Solomon sat on the throne, all Solomon had to do was get the workers together and say, boys, let's build it like God wants it built. And because of David's selflessness, Lord, I don't have to be the one to build your house. It was his desire to give God a house that was, you know, to man's ability, worthy of the majesty and the glory of God. They had that desire, but God said, you can't do it because of things you've done before. But he said, I will let you get everything ready. You know what materials? David went out and got best of the best. I wouldn't have been surprised if he went out and he inspected them cedar trees that came out of Lebanon and said, that, that one's got a knot in it, boys. Take it back. God only gets the best. Rather than stones that they started hewing out of that quarry he go back he says that one's got a funky line in it boys take it back it's either the best or nothing he didn't shirk the responsibility he embraced why because he knew he was doing well doesn't matter about the results if you're doing well all that matters is, is that you did what the master instructed you to do I remind it's required among stewards a man be found faithful Often we try to change that verse and say that amongst it's required that a man be found fruitful. No, faithful. God will take care of the fruit. All we've got to worry about is being faithful. Although Jeremiah saw no fruit, there's still fruit being reaped on his account today. Why? Because God preserved the words that he inspired him to write down. And there's still fruit coming from that labor that Jeremiah put in so long ago today. Jeremiah never saw it. But he realized it wasn't about the fruit, it was about doing well. Just being faithful to the one that told us to go out and do well. Good Samaritan could have given that man all the ingredients that he needed in order to bind up his wounds and to make himself whole. That would have been doing good. But that man was about a death's doorstep. He wasn't able to treat himself. He wasn't able to get himself to that end to be laid up and to heal. So the Samaritan, Samaritan said, instead of doing good, I'm going to do well, and I'm going to do it for him. Did he deserve it? I don't know. Don't know what the fellow did. Don't know where he came from. But the Samaritan knew that he needed help, that he couldn't help himself, so he said, I'll do the help. That's doing well. So, really, the whole point of the lesson was, do we do well? Not just on the Sabbath. Every day. Are we out trying to do good? Are we laboring for our own good? Or do we do well? Because the only way to hear well done is to do well down here. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Forms app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.